Okay. Thanks everybody for, for joining us. I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that the Community Foundations of Canada offices and I myself am today on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe and Algonquin Nation, whose presence here reaches back to time and memorial. I'm going to start us off um, after that acknowledgement with a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, the first is a friendly Zoom reminder that we can't see you, we can't see or hear you. Um, however, you can see and hear us, hopefully. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put those into the chat box. We'll be incorporating your questions uh, throughout the session, and we will also have a Q&A session later. The session is recorded and will be available to view on CFC's website after the session. It's available in both English and French. Alors, c'est accessible en français et en anglais. Uh, si vous voulez voir le, le version français, vous devrez seulement aller au bouton d'interprétation, un petit globe. So if you're looking to use the translation function, you just have to click on the little globe uh, button that says interpretation at the bottom of your screen. So what is the, the Healthy Communities Initiative? It is a $31 million investment from the Government of Canada to support communities as they create and adapt public spaces to respond to the new realities of COVID-19. With funding between 5,000 and 250,000, the Healthy Communities Initiatives aims to support local efforts to develop small scale infrastructure solutions, programming and services for communities across Canada, local governments, charities, indigenous communities and nonprofits are all welcome to apply for funding. Organizations can apply to the Healthy Communities Initiatives starting now through to March 9th. And that closes at 5 p.m. PST. Visit healthycommunitiesinitiatives.ca to find out more about how to apply, explore resources for applicants, and sign up for other community mobilization sessions. A second application round for the Healthy Communities Initiative will take place in May 2021. To discuss a little bit about the community mobilization sessions, over the next two weeks, our partners will host a series of community mobilization sessions sessions where you can learn more about the program themes, get inspired by project, project examples, excuse me, <laughs> and ask for advice on starting your project. All sessions will take place with simultaneous interpretation in French and English. The program has three themes. These include safe and vibrant spaces, uh, projects that create or adapt existing public places, uh, improving mobility options that permit physical distancing through permanent or temporary changes, digital solutions, including innovative digital projects that address changing communities' needs. Today's session, hosted by the National Association of Friendship Centers, is on maintaining a healthy sense of communities in Indigenous communities during COVID. Indigenous communities have experienced the devastating effects of pandemics in the past and through the resilience, resiliency of our communities. Oh, am I supposed to be saying this? Shadi, is this your part? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, I went right into it. So here's your introduction to Shadi as some people probably already know you. I really apologize for that. So Shadi is a special projects advisor at the National Association of Friendship Centers. And with that, I apologize once more, Shadi, <laughs> take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for uh, introducing the uh, the initiative and the, the, the opportunity that's uh, 
available to uh, uh, to most of the folks who are on the on the uh, webinar today. Um, also, if you want to, uh, you know, within the chat, feel free to introduce yourself and, and uh, mention uh, where you're um, where you're coming from or what organization you're you're representing here today, uh, just so we can all get a sense of who's here in the room with us and who's participating in this. So, uh, as Michelle had mentioned, uh, my name is Shadi Hafez. Um, I'm uh, Algonquin Anishinaabeg and Syrian. I'm a member of Kirigan Zibi Anishinaabeg and I uh, live uh, here on my um, uh, on my territory in Ottawa. Uh, I work at the National Association of Friendship Centers uh, as the Special Projects Advisor. Um, for those of you who are here that are with Friendship Centers, uh, most recently I was involved with the Investment Readiness Program through the NEFC and now I'm uh, doing a little bit of work on this. Uh, the NEFC is a um, uh, uh, a partner on this initiative and is uh, kind of helping uh, uh, spread the word, I guess, on, on what's going on and, and, and how our communities and organizations can uh, can access this potential opportunity. So um, just a little bit about uh, who we are uh, as, a, as an association. Um, National Association of Friendship Centers has been around since 1972 uh, and represents nationally uh, the growing number of friendship centers uh, emerging across the country. So uh, to date, we have uh, well over 100 friendship centers and provincial territorial associations from coast to coast to coast. And um, uh, friendship centers, for those of you who uh, uh, might not be familiar, although I'm, I'm sure that if you're in this webinar, you're likely familiar with Friendship Centers, um, uh, are Canada's most significant off-reserve Indigenous service delivery infrastructure and are the primary providers of culturally enhanced programs and services to urban Indigenous uh, residents. Uh, for over half a century, Friendship Centers have been facilitating the transition of Indigenous peoples from rural, remote and re reserved life to an urban environment. And uh, for many uh, in our communities, Friendship Centers are the first point of contact to obtain uh, referrals to culturally based socioeconomic programs and services. Uh, for myself, uh, living here in Ottawa, growing up in Ottawa as a, as a, uh, a young uh, Indigenous person in the city, uh, the Friendship Center here was uh, um, super vital to, I think, my connection to uh, community uh, uh, and to culture and to identity and uh, kind of helped in my own personal growth. So uh, for, you know, if you're not super aware with the work that Friendship Centers do, I can kind of attest that personally that they do really great work in cities and uh, uh, are continuing to do that great work. So uh, we'll just go to the next slide. So today, the, the, the kind of purpose of the webinar is I wanted to have a, a, a little discussion about, you know, COVID-19 in relation to our communities um, and talk, talk about kind of what, um, uh, what are some ideas around, you know, how can we maintain a healthy community despite um, uh, the, the kind of limitations and restrictions and impacts that COVID-19 has had uh, on our communities, both uh, 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 whether that be on reserve uh, in the north, uh, or in urban city centers and towns across the country, how our communities are kind of interacting with and relating to this uh, pandemic and, and the different things that we're doing. And um, so I kind of want to introduce this by speaking to um, the kind of reality that I think that we all know is that um, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has in a way been exemplified within our communities. We know that um, there's a number of issues related to our, our marginalization as communities that make different kind of uh, uh, health issues or diseases that come down the line are gonna impact us in, in significantly higher ways than, than some other populations in the country. And so uh, I use these quotes here. Um, this is from uh, Lisa Richardson and Alison Crawford in Scientific American, but healthcare among indigenous nations in Canada has always faced hardships shaped by social and structural inequities in housing and poverty and other social determinants. The conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age uh, as defined by the World Health Organization. So we know that there's a, a number of uh, uh, social determinants to health within our communities, uh, also structural uh, inequities uh, in relation to housing and poverty that kind of make uh, COVID-19 in relation to our communities a, a, a much, uh, I think, scarier reality uh, for whether that's uh, in rural, on reserve, or in cities. Uh, we see that folks are are facing the the kind of the blunt end of COVID-19. And, and I think what's really at stake uh, for a lot of us within our communities is um, 
prior to COVID-19, I think there was a lot of uh, amazing work being done uh, in a number of areas, whether that was in, in health, education, uh, economic development, uh, uh, cultural and, and spiritual revitalization, uh, land-based work, all that kind of stuff was happening in our communities. And I think there was a, a significant growth and, and resurgence of that within community. Uh, and I think COVID-19, unfortunately, has um, uh, uh, made it difficult for us to gather in ways where we can kind of continue to do that work. And it's made it a challenge to look at uh, how do we continue doing the work that we were doing prior to COVID-19, but in a, in a, in a significantly um, a changing kind of environment around us. Um, and I think what, what a lot of folks have been talking about and mentioning is uh, uh, specifically protecting the elders in our communities, whether that's in, uh, oh, I need to turn off this chat for a second because I keep reading the chats and then I'm getting a, <laughs> a little distracted there. Um, speaking to the knowledge, the knowledge, the cultural knowledge, the history, the language that's held by our elders in our communities, and, and the fact that COVID-19 really seems to be targeting our elderly populations, uh, looking at how we can uh, protect those populations, but at the same time ensuring that younger generations can still uh, access knowledge, can access our language, our cultures, and our identities has been, I think, a challenge for, for a lot of us in community. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of communities that are finding different workarounds for that. Um, so. You know, and at the same time, how can we protect our communities uh, uh, from things that might be kind of coming in from the outside in, while also maintaining connections to the outside as well when we need access to different resources and things like that. So those are some questions that I think have come about uh, during this uh, last, uh, I guess, year now. Um, and there's different, there's been different responses in communities. Uh, you know, I'm sure we're all aware and can all kind of speak to them ourselves. And, and, and you know, uh, from what I'm seeing, most of the folks here in this, in this webinar uh, are either work for community or for organizations within our communities. Uh, and so we know that there's a number of initiatives happening right across the board, uh, whether that's uh, kind of community-wide uh, uh, lockdowns that, that we're Kind of implementing ourselves or curfews that we're imp implementing ourselves our own specific measures and communities our own doctors and health uh health um workers in our communities kind of raising awareness and doing knowledge building uh around you know what COVID 19 is and some of the pushes for vaccinations in our communities and and, and spreading kind of awareness to uh to address some of the hesitancy that might exist out there uh looking at culturally relevant care in our communities uh uh whether that's caring for folks who have COVID or within the vaccination process itself. Uh, and then within, you know, within uh, urban communities as well, very similar responses too. And so um, it, we're not kind of sitting idly by, there's been a lot of response uh, that's community led. Uh, and so that's really amazing to see. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So when we look at maintaining a healthy community, uh, kind of despite COVID-19, I think it's really looking at, um, and, and I'm drawing a lot from uh, some previous work that I've done in the past. Um, uh, I was the mental wellness team coordinator in my community, uh, getting on ZB for, for um, roughly two years. Uh, and we did a lot of work around kind of community building and, and just public health initiatives uh, around wellness. And so I'm pulling a lot of this from that work that I had done in the past, but. Uh, I think when we look at maintaining a healthy community, we're, we're talking about maintaining a healthy sense of identity in the community, ensuring that our elders and our youth are cared for, but that they're also connected to one another. Um, that we are assessing and mitigating risk in our community um, in, in a uh, uh, in a proactive way uh, as opposed to a reactive way. Uh, that are that we have uh, community engagement, that community members are involved in decision making processes in the community, uh, that community members are informed of decisions that are happening in the community, um, that our governance is healthy, uh, that you know we have uh, uh, consistent connections between our leadership and the communities they represent, and that there's community involvement in that governance, uh, that we have food security in our communities, whether that's in urban areas or more remote areas or on reserve, that people have access to. Uh, not only affordable food, but healthy food. Um, there's a lot more to it as well, ensuring that we have, you know, uh, uh, housing, uh, healthy housing within our communities, um, that people who need to be cared for are cared for, whether that's elders or those with disabilities. Um, and so 
we know that COVID has fundamentally disrupted some of our abilities to maintain this, uh, especially in the sense of uh, uh, coming together as a community. Uh, we know in our communities that communal gathering is important coming together, whether that's in community meetings, uh, community meetings, let's say at friendship centers or band meetings in communities. We know that coming together and discussing things and important issues in our communities is important. Uh, and I know that some communities have had kind of different challenges and, and obstacles to uh, kind of coming together as communities to discuss these things. I know there's been issues as well around food security, um, issues with, with shipments of food or medicine coming into some communities and, and, and things leaving the communities. There's been issues with um, wanting to avoid uh, uh, folks from, uh, from hotter COVID areas coming into communities and, and such. Um, definitely been issues around uh, um, programs that had existed pre-COVID that say we're connecting elders and youth or connecting knowledge holders and youth, uh, doing uh, uh, any kind of spiritual ceremonies in communities, whether that's uh, Sundance or, or, or Sweat Lodge or anything like that in community, there's been challenges around kind of maintaining that. And so, you know, for folks who, who might be, you know, at home and dealing with their own personal issues, how do we ensure that their wellness is cared for in this kind of uh, era? These are all really big challenges. Um, and I think, you know, uh, one another big component of this is that, you know, a lot of our, our, our identity is based in our in our land based practice, our cultures and our traditions, our spirituality. And a lot of that is 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 uh, retained and transmitted orally. And so uh, how do we change that or not change that? But how do we um, uh, work to still transmit that that to different community members? Um, well, when we can't really gather as a as a as a people yet um or or trying to find different workarounds for how we can gather are, are some questions so um that's what i'm kind of hoping that uh with this uh with chci um there's opportunities for us to look at adapting uh some of our uh programs or services or infrastructure and community to help us maintain the sense of identity and help us ensure that our elders and youth are protected, but also that they can live healthy lives, uh, ensuring that we can assess and mitigate risks, ensure that we have continuous community engagement with community members, that our governance is healthy, that we have food security, housing security, uh, that community members can, can still uh, live within their communities and, and feel like they're in safe and healthy spaces is important. So, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll move to the, the next slide. So just to speak to kind of within our communities and organizations, um, who is eligible for CHCI? So we know First Nation, Métis, and Inuit governments are eligible to apply to CHCI. Um, indigenous, so First Nation, Métis, Inuit, LGBTQ, Two-Spirit Plus community organizations and nonprofits, that includes friendship centers, can apply. Um, Community lo organizations located on and off reserves. So uh, it's not just um, uh, First Nation governments that can apply for this, but if there's a community organization located on the reserve, they can also apply for this. Um, and there's, uh, there's a, a general kind of, um, uh, oh, sorry. Here we go. Sorry, I lost my notes here. There's a general eligibility that kind of projects uh, uh, must fall under. Um, so they have to respond to identified needs arising from the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, they have to create or adapt public spaces or programming and services for public spaces. They have to engage the community, uh, serve and be accessible to the public and or a community disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and fall within the three CHCI themes. So safe and vibrant spaces, improved mobility uh, options and digital solutions. And I think it's important that when we talk about public spaces, um, the NAFC had brought this up in our conversations uh, around the development of uh, this initiative. Uh, we recognize that, you know, a lot of our spaces are not necessarily public spaces. The public does not necessarily have access to our community spaces, uh, especially in, in on-reserve circumstances. Um, you know, urban circumstances are a bit different, but uh, our spaces are our spaces and, and that's okay. So as long as these programs um, uh, are, uh, serve and are accessible to the spaces within our communities, then, then that is fine. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about 
each of the three different streams uh, under CHCI um, so we can kind of understand what they are and what are some different uh, examples of things that folks are doing uh, right now uh, that fall within that, that maybe can inspire some ideas uh, amongst everybody in the webinar here to think about when applying for your own projects. Um, so really this looks at um, uh, Creating safe and vibrant spaces are projects that create or adapt existing public spaces, such as parks, uh, main streets, and indoor spaces that encourage safe cultural or physical activities and local commerce. Um, so what does that look like? What are some examples of, of, of what that may be? So we look at uh, possibly transforming outdoor spaces for community activities. So we know that gathering inside, especially, uh, uh, I know, uh, my experiences in, in some centers and organizations is that space can be limited sometimes for, for, for gathering. And so transforming outdoor spaces for community activities uh, is a possibility. Uh, enhancing, creating, or changing uh, recreational, cultural, or community spaces to ensure social distancing measures are in place. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, just off the top of my head, I'm thinking, you know, if you have uh, um, uh, uh, I've participated a lot in, in my community where we have, you know, various different workshops for like, um, or like birch bark basket making and stuff like that, you know, maybe you could create separate pods for people to work in. These are different ideas, but changing the structure of what exists within your space to ensure that people can uh, still participate in recreational, cultural or community events but making sure that uh, all the different social distancing measures are in place. This can be indoor or outdoor. We've seen examples in city parks right across the country where they kind of do the circle in parks and that's where you can kind of sit down with your family, say in, in, the, in those spaces. Um, I believe there's more to this slide. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I was getting confused with the French there. Um, community gardens and traditional medicine har harvesting and walking paths. Um, I know my community itself has a, a community garden uh, and we also do some, some traditional medicine harvesting uh, within the community. And we also have a walking path within the community. Um, but looking at how can we kind of, uh, um, uh, we have to keep in mind that, that within CHCI, everything is connected to adapting uh, to COVID-19. Um, so if this is going to be a community garden or a walking path, it has to be in response to a limitation or obstacle or barrier faced by COVID-19. And so communities are adapting to that. So this could be by bringing kind of uh, uh, programs and recreational and cultural activities uh, outdoors as opposed to having to do them indoors, um, providing kind of spaces for community members to um, walk safely and, and maintain some kind of physical activity within, within the community is important, especially when we know that things like gyms are closed or there might not be a, a uh, safe infrastructure for walking, let's say, within community. Um, and so these are things that can be looked at. And then we also look at land-based programming and outdoor tents, uh, say, for senior and community activities. Uh, we know that pre-COVID, there was definitely a, 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 a a push for a lot of land-based programming. I, I, myself, when I worked in community, we, we held some uh, um, land-based kind of wellness camps uh, for, for men and women in the community where we take people on the land, participate hunting, fishing, trapping, these different things. And so I think these are these are some, um, there's definitely been a lot of a lot of talk lately. I, I've seen in the media and I've seen in community conversations that folks are, are saying that, you know, returning to the land during COVID is definitely a, uh, 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 a positive for our community members since we can still we can maintain that connection or build that reconnection for a lot of folks and and, and uh stay healthy in, in the sense that we're not gathering indoors so these are some options and some things to thinking about think about when we're talking about um, safe environment spaces there's also uh um kind of a, a general list but you know talking about commissioning artists to create art installations in existing public spaces uh, to make those spaces a little more appealing to people to go and, and be within. Um, uh, for centers that might have uh, playgrounds for youth or communities that have playgrounds for youth, um, uh, revamping those spaces to make them um, so that kids don't have to necessarily congregate as much closer together uh, to, re to reflect social distancing measures. Um, uh, yeah, so that's essentially what the safe and vibrant spaces stream can look like. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. 
So I just want to share some kind of real world, real, real world examples of uh, things that are happening out there. We see uh, that the uh, Thunderbird House in Winnipeg uh, set up, uh, um, they call them warming tents. Uh, they're obviously putting up a teepee here, but um, uh, putting up these spaces for the homeless population during the extreme cold. We know uh, uh, there's been issues um, with uh, ensuring that homeless populations uh, can still be cared for despite uh, what, ha what is happening with COVID-19. And we know that there's been, uh, and I know in Ottawa itself, there's been issues with um, uh, COVID-19 outbreaks within shelters. And so looking at uh, alternative kind of solutions to this, and, and this is one example where Thunderbird House is putting up kind of outdoor spaces for folks. Um, so, th you know, this is a really great and amazing example of, of uh, adapting to uh, what's happening right now. Um, uh, but, you know, caring for each other in our ways is, is, is also really important and, and amazing. Um, so we also see um, uh, this on the land program uh, happening in the north uh, where folks were given uh, funds and, and the capacity to be able to go on the land and participate in hunting and trapping and fishing for longer, more extended periods of time uh, in communities where this is like really big and where, where folks are really out there doing this stuff, continuing to support that is really important. Um, it it kind of limits uh, uh, the gathering within communities per se and, and, and can limit the outbreaks that happen. Uh, so this has been a really amazing initiative uh, that I was taking a look at and it, it seems really great. We'll go to the next. Uh, so the next stream is uh, improving mobility options. So uh, this is projects that permit physical distancing through permanent or temporary changes that make it easier for people to get around in their communities, uh, whether that's walking, biking, accessing public and private transit uh, or other modes of transportation. Um, so really this is looking at kind of mobility in our communities and how can we adapt mobility uh, in this COVID-19 kind of climate that we're in. Uh, some possibilities that may exist uh, are, are things to think about. Uh, I know my community has set up uh, uh, setting up grocery delivery services for elders. Um, so having folks who can, you know, kind of pick up groceries for elders to avoid uh, uh, elders needing to come out of their home and go to the grocery stores within communities or to avoid even their, you know, families having to go out and do all that kind of stuff. So if the community can set up a delivery service for elders, but not just for elders, for any kind of folks in the community who might be at risk, um, uh, setting up some kind of delivery service provision for them. Uh, there's also been um, uh, different communities have set up uh, uh, I know in my community, we have things you can put on the window uh, and community service uh, folks will drive around the community. And if you need something or if you're uh, not in good shape and need some support, you can flip the paper around to kind of reflect that. That way community service workers will know when they're driving around who's in need of support and who's you know doing fine. So that's uh, something that can be set up. Uh, enhancing entry and service use in existing buildings. So uh, this could be drop off window, windows or counters. So changing the ways that people come in and out of buildings, whether that's um, your you know, local friendship center or organization in the city, whether that's your band office and community, your health center, um, looking at different ways of uh, how people come in to uh, receive service or, or, or have conversations with folks in the buildings, um, you know, it's changing the, the, or adapting the infrastructure that exists to, to uh, enhance the social distancing measures that, that we need to follow. Adapting or creating winter facilities with uh, increased comfort for community members. Um, this is just kind of reflecting that, you know, in a lot of our communities, uh, colder spaces and, and colder, colder areas uh, can affect mobility. And so creating uh, um, uh, different spaces that can kind of help people stay warm in the winter. Uh, updating or creating new mobility and accessibility options for rural or isolated communities. Um, I'm just seeing questions here. Oh, uh, so I know in some of our communities, uh, uh, 
access to community sometimes happens with ferries or barges. Uh, and so this is, you know, looking at updating or creating new mobility and accessibility options, different, maybe even setting up screening options. I know some communities have set up uh, checkpoints to come in and out of community. So how can we enhance those uh, uh, and ensure that there's uh, uh, effective precautions put in place for communities? Uh, programs that promote healthy mobility. So facilitating mobility activities, this could be the creation of bike paths, the, uh, the, the, or, or um, setting up like a bike lending program so people can bike around the community, maybe walking infrastructure as well. We had talked about walking paths, uh, but, but ensuring that people can still uh, stay physically active, uh, despite all the different kind of things that have caused um, that COVID-19 has caused to shut down, especially when it comes to uh, folks kind of staying in shape. Um, we've seen that there's been a, a significant uh, closure of gyms across the country. Uh, and I know in my own community, like our, our, our health center gym had to close down for a while. And uh, we all know that, you know, uh, at home uh, workout equipment and things are quite expensive. And so how can we promote healthy mobility within the community that, that, um, that is outdoors or socially distant? Um, I thought this was supposed to be under the digital solutions. I may have made a mistake here. Um, so this is one example here, uh, which was, I found a really interesting example and a really creative example to mobility options. So this is from uh, Beausoleil First Nation. Um, drones are delivering COVID-19 supplies. So uh, um, uh, different things like masks and gloves and hand sanitizer. Uh, so basically this, they've set up a, a partnership with this drone company that basically uh, flies in these supplies, drops them off and flies back. And the whole purpose of this, from my understanding, is to avoid uh, folks from outside the community coming in to make deliveries. Uh, so that might be folks coming in from Toronto or different uh, kind of hot zones in the province. Um, so this drone just picks up what needs to be picked up and drops it off to the community and goes back and does those things. I know that uh, Moose Cree also in, in uh, Northern Ontario has set up something similar to this as well. When I was looking into this drone company, they have something set up for... Um, for food deliveries, uh, which is really interesting. And uh, especially when we're talking about food security in the North, looking at different technology, mobility technology for uh, uh, accessing food uh, in a more cost-friendly way uh, is really important. So this was a really interesting idea that I thought I'd share with everybody. So the, the last stream is um, providing digital solutions. So this is innovative digital projects that address changing community needs, the use of data and connected technologies. Um, so this, I, I think this is where we've seen uh, uh, a lot happening in communities. Myself, I've participated in a lot of things online uh, and I've, I've participated in a lot of things that can be viewed as digital solutions uh, to, to maintaining and building uh, healthy communities uh, despite COVID-19. So we've definitely seen there's been a, a you know, virtual powwow uh, all over Facebook and cultural activities happening. So people are still maintaining uh, 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 this need to participate in things. I'm a dancer myself and, and you know, it's been hard. The last summer, we didn't get to go to any powwows. All year, there's been no powwows around dances in communities. And so maintaining that connection, not just for me, but for my kid uh, who's grown up in that, it's been challenging, right? Like we haven't been able to participate in who we are, um, but uh, some of these solutions are a little innovative and cool that we still get to hear songs and, and see people dancing and, and participate in that through, uh, uh, through the use of, digital technologies um, and different kind of cultural uh, uh, activities, right? So uh, uh, one of our partners here, the uh, Well Living House uh, that's uh, uh, ran by Dr. Dr. Janet Smiley had this midwinter celebration. Um, you know, we recognize that there's uh, a lot of conversations happening in community about um, whether some things should even be kind of broadcast this way. And so, uh, you know, that, that conversation is happening and, and some communities are, are, are choosing different responses to that. And uh, one of these responses has been to, to try and maintain and continue sharing through virtual ways. Um, looking at virtual elections and community meetings, I know uh, there's been friendship centers who have had their, uh, ourselves as a, a national association, we held our annual meeting online. Um, it's not an easy feat. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of capacity when it comes to, uh, you know, bringing somebody on to kind of organize that whole thing, especially when you have a really massive meeting and especially if there's voting to happen within that meeting. So within our annual meetings, you know, we have different things that need to be voted on. Um, 
And that can be a lot of work. And so, uh, but it's work that needs to keep happening. Our organizations and our communities need to uh, continue to govern ourselves and, and to run. And so uh, looking at different digital solutions for that, um, creating connectivity apps for community members or emer emergency signaling for elders. So, uh, you know, I had talked about the paper on the window thing, but there's different kind of things you can set up, uh, whether that's a, a, like an emergency button that might connect to uh, uh, whatever infrastructure you have in your community to help people um, or just creating connectivity apps for community members, whether that's like a, a chat group or messaging apps for people to continue communicating with each other. Um, a community lending library for tech supplies and increasing community internet access I know internet access is a, a, an issue in a lot of our communities, um, uh, not just in rural areas, but also just the cost of internet in urban uh, places as well for a lot of our communities. And so looking at how can we, uh, given the fact that a lot of our folks are, are having to stay at home uh, and, you know, what comes with that, you know, most things now are, are online streamable just for the sake of uh, your own well-being and, and not going uh, not being bored to death at home, but having access to internet to be able to, to, to just stay connected. Um, but then looking at also lending things out to community members, whether that's laptops or computers, modems, um, different things that will help people stay connected. Uh, next slide, I think. Yeah, also tech training for elders and seniors. So we see with this kind of um, stay at home measures that are in place, uh, like I said, a lot of things are happening now. If people want to communicate, people communicate online uh, or over cell phones and things like that. And so having tech training for elders and seniors to be able to know how to navigate these spaces is also important, especially if this is going to be, uh, uh, if we're going to be in this for, for a bit longer. Um, you know, whether that's, uh, I know my grandmother, you know, has, has uh, some trouble uh, using technology. And so just having that set up so that they can maintain connection, whether that's maybe learning how to Zoom with their family to stay connected with their family members and things like that is important. So something to think about. Uh, virtual communication between students and home communities. I know that there's been a lot of issues for uh, students who leave their communities to go to university in the city. Um, and there's been issues about, you know, uh, can they come home? Should they come home? Especially if they're coming from kind of um, more COVID hotspot cities like, like Toronto. Um, so how can we facilitate connection between students and their families, especially if the students are living alone in cities during this pandemic it can be extremely challenging on them. And so maintaining that connection with community is really important. Uh, online language classes. Uh, I participate in a language class every week in my community. Um, where the, uh, our, our, our cultural center is now, the language classes that would have been held at the cultural center are now being held online. And I, I have to say, it's been amazing because um, it's been a much larger turnout as people seem to really be drawn to it. So they're jumping online, an hour and a half language class online every week. Um, so that, that's really amazing. Uh, we'll go to the next, uh, yeah, so this is just an example um, from a friendship center uh, doing Anishinaabe Moen online classes. Uh, these are some things that you can think about. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is from uh, Nipissing First Nation uh, who uh, had um, online voting for their community election. I know that this can be a little more uh, challenging uh, uh, if communities don't have their own custom election codes. Um, but if you do, uh, there's there's possibilities to set up online voting, but not just for community voting. Uh, or there's also the possibility for referendums if you have important referendums coming up in your community uh, to avoid kind of people all going to the ballot spaces. But if you are going to be doing in-person ballot spaces, is also the opportunity to set up uh, different uh, uh, social distance measures within those spaces. Uh, but also for community organizations, friendship centers. Uh, you know, you have your annual meetings. You might be having an election for the board. Um, you, you you maybe might be able to set up an online meeting uh, and maybe an online uh, uh, voting process. So that's something to think about. Um, so that's it on my end in terms of what I wanted to share, uh, some of the different conversations happening with regards to our communities and, and some of the things that folks are doing uh, uh, to adapt to COVID-19 within our communities. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not everything, it's not an incredibly exhaustive list, but uh, I tried my best to uh, try and spark some ideas and, and, and get us to think about what we can, uh, what we can do and what we can apply for with this uh, funding opportunity. Um, 
So with that, I think what we're going to be doing now is uh, uh, opening this up to for questions. Uh, we're joined by uh, Rupal, who's going to be helping me answer uh, some questions since I'm not uh, probably the best to speak to a lot of the more uh, intricate questions with related to CHCI. So I just want to say miigwech to everybody for um, uh, listening to me during this webinar. And uh, I hope I was able to relay some information out to everybody in an in a effective way. So miigwech. Thanks, Shadi. Those were some amazing examples of projects, so I think we're off to a great start. Uh, my name is Rupal. I work at Canadian Urban Institute, which is one of the partners on this project. And I want to also introduce Michelle from Community Foundations of Canada, who is here to answer some questions that folks in the chat might have about this program. Uh, and until we see some questions in there, I have a couple of questions that I thought I might ask. Um, if somebody is here representing an organization that maybe isn't on the list of eligible orgs, maybe they're a grassroots organization or another type that isn't included, how can they benefit from a program like this? Well, um, they can benefit by partnering with another organization. So we have um, pretty extensively thought about who can apply for this program and anybody who is not listed in our kind of our wholesome list of the applicant guide, they can apply by partnering with an organization that is in fact eligible. So there, we have a couple of forms that might help you get started with what that would look like in terms of an intermediary kind of agreement to make sure that everybody's on the same um, kind of page when it comes to working together. But you would have one lead applicant who would uh, fill in the application form and be the, of, I'm going to say this word wrong, <laughs> the financial lead, um, but the anybody can partner alongside them to, to work together to make the project happen. And that actually leads me to a related question, which is, let's say um, you're putting in an application for this program. And as we, uh, as we know, you can only apply, one organization can only put in one application. So what if you have multiple projects you'd like to be involved with? Right. So, um, so there are going to be two rounds of funding. Organizations can submit one application per round. Organizations that have applied are welcome to partner with multiple other organizations when submitting independent applications. So I think that answers your question. Um, Great. So it sounds like partnership is key. Sorry, Shadi, I think I talked over you. No, I was just going to throw in another question. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, uh, I, I noticed and realized that I hadn't gone over the uh, funding amounts and there was a question about, the, I believe there's two different um, kind of funding streams that folks can apply for. Maybe we could talk about that. Right, so um, the kind of overall funding available is 5,000 up to 250,000. Uh, the funding streams are laid out um, pretty simply. When you go online into the application form, you would select the region where you're located, where your project is going to take place first, and then you would select the amount of dollars that you're requesting. So this means that you need to, so we have a map available online where you can, you can figure out where you're located in terms of our own hubs. Um, then you would click on that. And then if it's over 100,000, you're actually going to be evaluated against other larger projects, rather than only at the local level, there will be local impact to or sorry, input to making those decisions. But the, uh, the applications themselves will be evaluated in a different stream. There's also an opportunity for if you have um, you know, if your geography does not match exactly into one of these hubs, you're actually, um, you know, spreading across different hubs, you can apply through a cross regional stream. Or alternatively, if you're a national level organization, and you have impact throughout, you can apply to, again, a different stream. So it's based on where you're located first, and then separated further by um, either money amounts or by um, the kind of national level impact. But it's it's laid out very clearly in our application form. So so hopefully it doesn't cause too much confusion. And again, if 
if you read the applicant guide and reach out to any of us with questions, that should help. And can you explain, uh, there might be projects that maybe fit more than one project or program theme. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. So multiple themes are, are you know, positive, not recommended. You don't have to have all of them, but if you have more than one, then that's, that's positive and it helps your community in, in more than one way, which is fantastic. There are some questions about whether there will be a, a second round of funding and whether folks can apply during that second round of funding with an application that maybe wasn't successful the first round. Can they revise it and come back? Yes, there will be a second round of funding and yes, you can reapply again. Um, we would suggest that you consider perhaps uh, why the application was not eligible the first time or sorry, not eligible, but wasn't approved the first time and, and then make some tweaks for the second round. Just scanning the chat for more questions. I see one here. When will decisions be made about funding for the first round? I know there is an answer to that. <laughs> you just need to give me a moment to find that. Um, I believe it's in April. Can we can we go to another question while I look that up? Is that possible? Sure. I think the um, the question around uh, can there be an economic development component like supporting local businesses and markets uh, is an important one. So the April 30th is confirmed. That's the date for results. So what was the question again, sorry? Uh, can there be an economic development component like supporting local businesses and markets? There can be a component, um, but the kind of the, the overall theme does need to be about inclusive public spaces. So and it needs to be from an, el an eligible organization type. Can we can we speak to um, also kind of how uh, what the re review committees of decision making is going to look like with regards to this? I know that there's regional kind of hubs that are making those decisions, um, but what what kind of what does the makeup of those of those look like? On the review committees? Yeah. So the review committees are kind of locally curated. Um, we're providing guidance in terms of equity, in terms of voices on those. We're working hard to ensure that diversity, marginalized voices, and populations disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 are con contributing to that evaluation process but each committee in terms of kind of regionality is, is going to look slightly different depending on their local context. And can you clarify whether, if there's a first application that isn't accepted, will there actually be time between the two rounds to revise and come back? So the timeline between, um, when the second round opens and is closed is a little bit longer. So there will be time to adjust as needed. Again, I think those timelines are mentioned in the applicant guide exactly. So our team will be able to, there we go. <laughs> it's in the chat. So the application portal is open on May 14th and they must be submitted by June 25th. Again, applicants who do not receive funding in the first round may reapply to round two, but will not be guaranteed funding. And what if somebody who's unsuccessful in the first round is looking for some feedback on, on how they can improve their application and make it stronger for the second round? So we will be providing some high level feedback um, 
we at CFC can kind of curate that information and provide you again, it's only going to be high level. It's not uh, nitty gritty details, but we should be able to provide you with some guidance that will help you for a, a potentially a second application. And if people have questions that maybe are really specific to their situation or really specific to their organization that might not be relevant for everybody who's attending today, where would they go to get some of those questions answered? We have a fully staffed email address. Uh, people are, are answering questions all the time. And so I would really strongly recommend that everybody reach out to our uh, chci at communityfoundations.ca for any of those specific questions you have about whether or not a specific situation would be eligible, whether or not a project would be um, thematically related, any kind of detailed question, absolutely reach out to us. Um, very, very responsive, very quick times. Uh, I, think, I think we're saying within two days right now you get an answer, so please reach out there. For any friendship centers uh, who are in attendance as well, feel free to reach out to me, uh, S Hafez, S H A F E Z, at nafc.ca. If you need any assistance or just want to have a conversation about your idea and see if it's a fit based on uh, our understanding of everything, um, feel free to get in contact with me. Looks like there's a question about budgeting. So the applicant guide references that funds can be applied for that are spent uh, anytime between April 2020 and June 2022. Can you please talk a little bit more about how that works and, and, um, and how that timeline works? Hmm. So all budget items must be project related and funding recipients must incur expenses between that April 1st, 2020 and June 30th, 2022. So it is retroactive. Eligible expenditures will vary depending on the project, but future and retroactive expenses must be project specific. Applicants will need to include a budget of anticipated expenses as well as the retroactive, retroactive expenses um, with, within their application submission, submission and that budget. It looks like we are a few minutes away from ending the session. So if anyone's got any last minute questions, please do throw them in the chat and then I will, um, I'll pass over to Michelle to close this out. I'm seeing thank yous, no new questions. And always remember, like Michelle said, if you have any further questions, you can follow up with the help desk. Um, over to you, Michelle. Miigwech, miigwech everyone. That was great. Thank you so much, Shadi. Um, I think your ideas have been great. It's great to see the creative juices flowing. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to talk about the program for everyone. Uh, great job. Again, I apologize for, for speaking over you earlier. <laughs> thank no you, thank everyone. You. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. Yeah, miigwech to everybody for uh, participating and uh, for uh, listening to me go on and on about this. So thank you. <laughs> so thanks everyone. We do have some further mobilization sessions going on actually every day this week. Um, and you'll see there's a poll on your screen just to let us know how we did. So if you could vote before you sign off, that would be fantastic. Again, thank you everyone. Have a great day.